there, Cindy Dole, and this is Home Wizards, hour two of what I like to believe is your home for all things home garden and life improvement. Thanks for sharing part of your Saturday with me because we love talking about the, just the little things and the big things that I hope will uh, give you a boost and make you feel like when you walk home and you sit down, you go, ah, it's a good day, life is good, I'm home, you know? And so coming up in the next hour, uh, we're going to talk about collecting books. Now, I know that a lot of us have books, and gosh, books with computers, what are you going to do? <laughs> but we all have these great books that I think are either little special books that you just can't you know, you can't part with because even though you've read the book, you might want to go back and read it again. Or maybe for in my case, I have some old childhood books that my mom handed down to me. And those are classic treasures. And so maybe with Valentine's Day, you might be thinking about some love story books. And what about when you have these books, what makes your book collection really of value? Well, we have our friends from Bunhams and Butterfields here today, a woman who, well, I asked her, do you collect? And she goes, no. <laughs> but she really knows a lot about books and why they do. They really do tell a story about you. And so we're going to talk to her about that and how do you know if the books that you have or the books that you start to get are good things to, to start saving up, all right? Then a little bit later, we can't forget what tomorrow is. It's that time where we're going to have some gridiron grub. And uh, so we're going to talk a bit with my husband, Ben there, Bill, and I also have some fun little ideas to kind of spruce up the place and uh, make that, that very casual but, you know, religious annual thing, that party that we know as the super party for the big game. Um, what are you going to serve? What are you going to do, how many people are coming over, and the good news is you can put it all together in the, on the fly. So no stress there. And then later on, we're going to give you some good ideas for the month of February, those those to-dos that you must uh, remember. But first, let's get to um, our first guest here for the hour, who's going to help us um, collect books and know what it is that makes them so special. Hey, let me Yeah, little Bo Diddley, because, you know, books do tell a story, not just about uh, the author and the subject that they are writing about, but really, it's kind of a, a mirror, a reflection of you, and why is it that you like them, and that you've read them and keep them, and then maybe you want to get more of them, and so I thought it'd be fun to talk about um, how do you collect books, and why is that something that could be really neat uh, for you in your home, and so with me is Catherine Williamson. She is the director of Fine Books and Manuscripts at Bunhams and Butterfield, so thanks for being here, Catherine. Thank you for having me. And so you've studied English literature. I have. So you know all about this stuff, but you don't collect books, personally. I, I don't, really. I don't. I mean, I, I I appreciate collecting. I get to see so many beautiful books in the course of my day at work that I just feel like they come across my desk, I find them a new home, and that's good enough for me. I don't really need to bring them into my home. So you kind of have a, a collection by extension. You exactly. Don't need I get to, to enjoy everybody <laughs> else's collections for short periods of time. So you don't and have to worry about the clutter and what it, where to I put them all. You know? Right, yes. Because that's always the thing we have to caution people because whenever you think about collecting, I mean, you have to be sure that you have the space and that it's not going to just be crazy making, you know, right. because a lot of us, I think, kind of go to the extreme. Right. But one great thing about collecting books is that you can actually have a pretty substantial collection in a, in a fairly small space. You don't mm -hmm. have to have... Uh, you don't have to have several garages for your cars or uh, a new house for all of your furniture. You know, you can you can have uh, hundreds of volumes of books, you know, on a single bookshelf. Now, so with this whole craze of the e-book, mm -hmm. I have to ask you this because that was on everyone's Christmas list, right? To right. have one of those. Right. Does that increase the value of the old-fashioned book somehow? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, the, the, the antiquarian book market, in other words, people who buy and sell um rare editions, first editions, first appearances in print of um, of um, of literary titles or scientific titles or whatever it is, that market is really independent of modern publishing. Modern publishing is a totally different animal. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to change the antiquarian book market in 30 years or 50 mm. years. I don't see much of an effect right now, mm -hmm. but I do think, I mean, my colleagues and I talk about this, you know, what what is going to happen 50 or 100 years from now when, when people try to collect letters and documents and books, um, but... But starting at around 2000, we became kind of a paperless society. What will there be for people to collect? You know, mm. you and I aren't writing notes back and forth to each other oh. anymore the way our ancestors Good old were. mom, yeah. where's your thank you note? Right. All that stuff. Oh. Authors, emerging authors are, are publishing their books online. Mm -hmm. They're not putting out these little limited editions of 500 or 1,000, um, which, you know, to, to share things are going online. So, yeah, I do think 
you know, pr- maybe not in my lifetime or maybe at the very end of my career, things will probably change, but it's not changing things right now. Mm-hmm. Well, you were saying before we, we got on the air here that, that really books do tell a, a magnificent and charming story. And, and it sounds like when you see someone, a client, uh, a prospect who comes uh, to your place there on Sunset, um, mm-hmm. that uh, you can kind of peg them, right? I can tell a lot about somebody by what books they have on the bookshelf. And so can you. I mean, I think when you go to a new person's house, you, you that's a very human thing to go browse somebody's bookshelves to see what they're interested in. What books have they read? Who's their favorite author? Uh, what kind of political things might they be interested in? Um, so you can do that with anybody, but particularly with people who collect antiquarian books, you can you can really figure um, because because the field has become divided into s- separate subjects. So if I go into into one library and I see, you know, I see Nathaniel Hawthorne and I see Herman Melville, I'm like, oh, you love American lit. You're into you're into these. Have you read this? Have you read that? Are you interested in that? Um, if I see a certain number of maps, I'm like, oh, you like oh. maps and travel literature. Oh, I love maps. And and usually you can tell where people's ancestors are from mm-hmm. by which maps they have on their wall. It's like, oh, do you have family from Scotland? Mm-hmm. Oh, you have family from Brazil. You know, it's it's um, you can figure out a lot of people. And actually, that's why people do it. They want you to ask those questions, you know, about mm-hmm. look at my beautiful map. Tell why do you have this map of South America? Well, let me tell you. you it's know. like a scrapbook, isn't it? It is. It is. Isn't that nice? Well, I mean, there's so much to cover, and I mean, I'm just my head is just spinning with all the different questions in, in terms of like where do you begin? And I'm thinking about these books that my mom and dad um, handed down to me, and they are literally, I mean, they're quite dusty, and I mean, the the seam is kind of coming apart, and it's a childhood story book, and I had, you know, I had my mom's handwriting, and there it was oh, given yeah. to her from an aunt, and mm-hmm. those kind of things. I mean, those are special, probably only to me, but you never know. Are those classic things that are treasures somehow? Well, you're probably right. It is probably the sentimental value is probably greater yeah. than than any um, intrinsic value. Children's books are tricky because most of the time we let children handle them and then they destroy them. So the condition of most children's books by the time they reach this secondary market is pretty dismal. For for a children's book to be collectible. It has to be pristine, which oh. means no kid ever touched it. No crayons. Right. No crayons, no torn pages, no peanut butter, no torn covers. <laughs> so that's kind of hard to yeah. do. It, needs, it also needs to be, you know, a classic title. It needs to be Alice in Wonderland or the Wizard of Oz books or the Raggedy Ann, Raggedy Andy. Those are all collectible children's book or like will titles. harry potter be a collectible harry potter want? already is collectible uh-huh. already is yes um the the first edition of the first book the london of the philosopher's stone harry potter and the philosopher's stone was published by a, a fairly small publishing house in in england they're not small anymore but they were small at the time so it came out in a in a small print run of a either five or ten thousand copies not very many um and by the time the second book came along that contract had been bought out by a larger publishing house, and the second ones came out in in print runs of hundreds of thousands or even a million copies. So, so the so they're much less rare. But if you have the true first edition mm. of the first Harry Potter novel, that's what only thirteen years old or so, yeah, it can be several thousand dollars now. Hmm. Is it important? You mentioned pristine is is being a good one in terms of making it of value. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have to have, or is it good to have the entire set? Does that make that somehow more? That would value? be good. Yes, if you had the whole set, you know, of, like the Nancy Drew collection right. <laughs> or whatever. Well, no, not that. Maybe one. maybe Nancy Drew, not so much. But, but it was a favorite you, of mine. If you if you uh, the the Harry, well, let's go back to Harry Potter. Sure. The titles I've seen at auction are either simply the first one, simply the first title, or the complete set. Altogether, no. Um, those are your two options for for Harry Potter. Um, also, apparently, it's it's rare, or it's gotten harder to get them signed mm-hmm. by J.K. Rowling. So the signed mm-hmm. editions can be collectible mm-hmm. uh, as well. well. When we come back, uh, speaking of the other Potter, um, the bunny rabbit that we uh, oh, we yeah, can't yeah. forget, Beatrix Potter, where you can have some of those up for auction, and we're going to talk about that and some Valentine's Day collectibles, and then we can't forget. Eric Clapton is in the mix somehow. He is. You have some of his goodies. So that's a perfect segue to little Eric music as we segue to our next segment. Don't you go away. We have more fun as we're talking about books and collecting them at your home. Maybe you have a question. You can call on in at 888-KFWB980, 888-539-2980. I'm Cindy Dole, and we're Home Wizards. We're back after this.
we got to let this run a little bit, Seth. This, of course, is Layla. I know you're singing in your car right now. Eric Clapton and uh, Sydney Duel here. We're talking about him and other things because it all has to connect to the Bunnums and Butterfields auction house that I love. Uh, they're right there on Sunset uh, in the Hollywood area. And with me is a woman who works there. She gets to be the director of fine books and manuscripts, Catherine Williamson. So what a fun job you have. It is very fun. And so you've already seen some of the Eric Clapton stuff? Actually, I haven't. It's in London. It's coming up. And it's coming over in a couple of weeks. And we're going to explain how we can get a piece of some of that. Um, well, there's a preview, I guess, in a week or so. And then that's come up in March is when the, the auction for right. the Eric stuff begins. But right here, right now, like a week from tomorrow is a chance to add to your book collection and it might be something that brings love to the air right <laughs> tell me about some of these love stories that are that are going to be part of the auction we have some really cute things we have a sale sunday morning on uh, on the 13th uh, and it has a lot of great general lit we have some of the sort of great romantic novels of all time we have a beautiful pristine first edition of gone with the wind really yeah maybe the most perfect dust jacket i think i've seen um, of that copy. Um, we have a really nice copy of The Scarlet Letter, if you want something a little bit more ooh, downbeat, ooh. Uh, but also very intense and and, and romantic. Um, we have... Um, uh, we have other things, you know, things romantic things, and then things that are just sort of lovely and cute. We have this original illustration by Beatrix Potter of, um, not of Peter Rabbit, of a series of vignettes of a guinea pig that she was working on in... Um, for for a short story that she she animated and it comes with this really great story so so the sheet of paper and you see five little vignettes of a guinea pig it's the same guinea pig and he's and he's he's grooming we say he's grooming but not like a guinea pig he's brushing his hair <laughs> and he's brushing his teeth and he's putting on a tie and a coat and a hat and a cane and then then he sort of takes off uh, out the door and and um, when we were cataloging this piece we went through her journals, which are published, her, her journals, and there was actually a reference to having drawn this little, this, having produced this little drawing. She, she writes that she had borrowed a guinea pig from a friend of hers who raised them she, to, to produce it. So she borrowed this one guinea pig uh, that they called Queen Elizabeth, um, who was very beautiful and fluffy, and she drew her in any number of different angles. But while she was drawing her, she got into everything, and she ate string, and she ate a button, and she ate uh, all these things that she wasn't supposed to eat well she's a queen <laughs> yeah, right but 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 so she finished her drawing and then in the middle of the night uh beatrix potter realized that the guinea pig <gasps> no yes. no yes no yes yes uh -oh. Oh, so no. she had to take la, la, the guinea pig back i know oh, so sad no. so it's a it's a it's this wonderful delightful picture with kind of a dark side oh. dark underbelly to it okay. but beautiful but a beautiful exquisite drawing um you don't hear about guinea pigs in childhood books that you often. You know, I think this cute, is why. I think they're cute. hard models, and and people don't use them. Uh huh. Yeah. So you have some of the love stories, mm -hmm. as, and the man. Oh, I love the idea of the Gone with the Wind. I mean, so we can oh. see that on display, right? You can see the Gone with the Wind. You can see. Uh, 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 you can see all of this. It's all on the gallery on mm -hmm. on Sunset Boulevard, mm -hmm. seven six zero one Sunset. We're here all. T today till five o'clock. Tomorrow from ten to five. Anybody can come in. There's other property. There's another sale, um, previewing at the same time uh, with furniture and jewelry too. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of fun things to see. And when you do go to the auction, you get a paddle, right? You register. <laughs> you register. You give us your name and your information. We give you a paddle, and you sit in the room. And when you see something that you want, you just raise your paddle, and we call on you. And you raise it until the number goes past what you want to pay and then you make sure you pull it down. You can't halfway raise it. I mean, it's got to be a full legitimate, well, I to, want this. <laughs> yeah. Commit to the commit to the joke. Okay. Um, so I think a lot of people as they're listening to this, uh, it's so enchanting to, to just, to, I think, get back to books. And um, I know that so many of us do have books that we've saved over the years. Mm -hmm. What about paperback books? Is that even something that's worthwhile? That's I, even a collection? For the most part, no. There okay. are certain... Um, but of course, every time you say that, there's some exception yeah, to the rule. Right. There are certain Think of comic books. books you know? that, well, comic books, yes, can be very collectible. Yeah. There are certain books that were published in paperback because um, because they were underground, or because the publisher really didn't want to take a chance on a particular writer who then turned out to be um, someone kind of important. The first um, uh, 
you know, one of William Burroughs's first book was published in um, in in paperback. You know, mm-hmm. and that actually happened with a lot of the beat poets who had who weren't being published by major publishing houses. They were kind of putting them out themselves, or these kind of fly by night mm-hmm. publishing houses were putting these books out. So they did things as cheaply as possible, which means paperback covers. So yes, there are some some collectible books, but in general. Modern trade paperbacks are not collectible. Mm -hmm. But for those of us who do have some nice hardback books that Mm -hmm. we think, gosh, you know, it looks it looks like it's in pretty good shape. It seems like it's a a classic. We can bring them down to Bonhams and Butterfields, and you'll help tell us, hey, forget about it, or yeah, that's a good value. Right. I'll try to let you down gently, but (laughs) the once a month, the last Wednesday of every month. So this month, I believe that date is the twenty. Third, mm-hmm. um, we have an open appraisal clinic, which means all the specialists come down from mm-hmm. upstairs. We all sit around at tables. You can bring up to five items. You can bring any combination of things that you want. If you want to bring a big thing of silver and a painting and a book and a you know a, a piece of furniture, mm-hmm. fine. Up to five items, and uh, you 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 make your way around and you see all of the specialists. So from nine thirty to twelve thirty, we're down there, mm-hmm. and uh, you get your you get a free appraisal. You know, hmm. for, uh, and and most of the time I do let people down gently. I, I have to say, you know, most of the time, ninety five percent of the stuff that comes in, you know, it's it has some value, but maybe not quite enough. But every now and then, you know, people really do surprise me. They really will bring in something that is uh, an absolute treasure. We've had people bring in fifteenth century illuminated manuscripts mm. just you know that turned that we wound that we sold for hundred and thirty thousand dollars for wow. them. We've had people bring in, you know, letters that they're you know, presidential letters really? that some ancestor had gotten uh-huh. for something wonderful that they had done. I had somebody bring in a, a big stack of Eisenhower letters that, you know, his grandfather had gotten and we sold those for him for a bunch of money. So mm. so it's um it's, I think it's a lot of fun for people to come to clinic, but uh, it's fun for us, too, because treasures oh, do bet. turn up. Yeah. Yeah. And we can learn not only from going to the clinic, but also just kind of, uh, I guess, maybe reading up a bit about it or going online in terms of what how to start a collection. Mm-hmm. And then I always worry about, especially something like a book, how do you preserve your collection? How do you preserve some of these great classic treasures? That- right. Well, books are, are paper, and, and this is California, so it can, be, it can be tough. I always tell people, you know, keep your books or your paper away from light, from heat, and from moisture. So if you've got a sunny room, that should not be your library. The darkest room in the house should be your library. You should, you know, not blast the heat, at least in that particular room, if you can avoid it. And and hopefully there's no kind of what you'd have no floods <laughs> or water problem. Well, you yeah, know, keep things keep things sort of evenly, you know, evenly humidified and evenly temperatured. The the real the real collectors, the you know, the really people who are very intense about it. They have vaults a bit, huh? They have vaults or they have basements and they have, you know, things set up to to moderate the humidity and the temperature all, so it's the same. So all, it's the wine, the cigars, and the books. And the books, that's right. <laughs> See, and they're all because there so you can enjoy them all at the lounge. same time. Well, we can't forget Eric Clapton. And so tell us about the how this all came about. You have some of his guitars he, that are going to be up for, uh, for auction? We do. We are going to be selling collections of his guitars and his amplifiers, which he's never actually hmm. uh, released before. He founded several years ago... Uh, um, a an addiction clinic yes. yeah. um, called Crossroads, and so he ha- is selling this collection of guitars and amplifiers to raise to money help. for Crossroads. I mean, he, and and one of the great things that that the money allows him to do is not just expand the program. So instead of just individual rehab, they have family programs now, but also they um, are able to give scholarships to people who otherwise might not be able to afford the services. So it's a really terrific, it was amazing of him to found it in the first place. And then, you know, he's sort of continuing on to to provide this tremendous um, service. Will he be there? Community. Do we get to say hi to him? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You're I keeping it a secret. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. I really don't know. Okay. All uh, right. I, I don't know. So he, in this collection that we're going, that we're going to be selling in New York um, on March 9th, we have about 70 guitars and uh, about the same number of his amplifiers. And the guitars include... Uh, a, a lot of things that he's been playing recently. Um, hmm. He's he has. Um, I actually have some 
I need to check my notes, but he, you know, he's he's been playing a lot of uh, interesting guitars over the years. Um, one, the one that he's played most recently that people are, I think, most excited is this. Uh, it's a Stratocaster, a Fender Stratocaster that he he's been playing for mm. the last three or four years, and it, they call it Daphne, the Daphne Blue uh, finish on the. Uh, if you've seen him and he's playing this yeah. like, kind of baby electric baby blue guitar we have that guitar well Catherine uh, Catherine Williamson we'll have to check things out that's a Bonhams and Butterfields right mm-hmm. there on Sunset in mm-hmm. Hollywood you can go there tonight or tomorrow and uh, go to the website and find out more about these absolutely auctions fun having you love it thank you all right well up next of course it is the big day tomorrow are you having some company over we're gonna get you ready with the decor and the food and all that stuff home wizards I'm Cindy Dole and the fun continues after this